So I'm specifically talking about depression and the road to recovery this evening rather than recovery in a more um, general way. So I'm conscious that some of you might not be uh, familiar with the ins and outs of depression, so I just thought I'd say a few words in the initial part of the talk about depression and then we'll move on to have a look at treatment, um, recovery from a uh, depressive episode and of course what might be new coming down the track, what, what, what developments there might be in the field of recovery since to date we know we don't have all the answers. So just to start with, rather than saying what depression is, I thought we'd begin by saying what it's not. So as you can see, it, the depression is not just feeling fed up. It's not just the Monday morning blues. It's not just a temporary thing that lasts a few minutes or a few hours and then it passes off and you feel better once you've had your breakfast or the morning coffee and you're okay again. So it's nothing got to do with Mondays, Monday mornings or any other morning in fact either. It's also not what is often described nowadays as a bad hair day. Um, I have to say Deirdre, our team secretary, is responsible for the graphics and she thought it would be funny to have a bad hair cat, for some reason best known to herself, on the, on the slide to represent it. So a depressive episode is not just a question of you not pulling yourself together. Um, it has nothing got to do with being fixed or being treated with a spot of retail therapy. And a chat and a cup of tea doesn't fix it either. So what is depression then and, and how do we define it? Well, in recent decades, it's defined by the Diagnostic Statistics Manual and the fifth version of it um, is published in the last year or so. The, it's, it's for research purposes, really, the, the DSM, but it's a, hem, a helpful um, guide, as it were, to ensure that depression is being measured by the same symptoms in the same way um, everywhere in the world, so that if research is being carried out, the, the same kinds of depressive episodes um, are being measured. And so it, it helps to have a look at it from a diagnostic perspective. So what's the hallmark of all, of all depressive episodes is the fact that it's the presence of low mood. Now, some people can be depressed without actually feeling low, um, believe it or not. But inevitably, even if the person themselves says, oh, well, I don't feel depressed, if asked about, well, have you lost interest or have you lost enjoyment out of things that normally you would enjoy? And the answer, if somebody is depressed, to that question is always yes. And in addition, then, there are the, there's the requirement for five symptoms over, to be persisting over at least a minimum of a two-week period. And the five symptoms need to come from this list. This is the DSM list. So weight can be lost or gained. Uh, sleep can be disturbed and foreshortened. But it's also true to say that sleep can be increased. So oversleeping can be a symptom uh, in the same way as undersleeping can be symptomatic. Um, psychomotor agitation, retardation, that's where there's a lot of restlessness and fidgeting going on or else there is a time delay. Someone is so slowed up, they're slow to respond to, to, to questions, they're slow to respond to, to go about their business. And in terms of solving problems and concentrating, there can be a slowness in, in actually working the brain, as it were, as well. There is frequently a loss of energy or a sense of tiredness. There is sometimes feelings of worthlessness or feeling guilty even when there isn't anything to feel guilty about. Loss of concentration is often an early symptom. Indecisiveness, trouble making a decision, and that can be even in relation to um, what, what to have for dinner, what to buy in the supermarket, or, or what to take from the fridge. And there may be recurrent thoughts of death and or suicidal thoughts, and there may, of course, be plans depending on the severity. So all of these symptoms are associated with a major depressive episode, but the episode is not related to any substance misuse. So it's, it's not it's depressive symptoms which stand alone even in the absence of alcohol excess or drug, illicit drug misuse, and it's not related to any physical underlying condition, whether it be a viral infection or um, medication or sometimes um, endocrine ad abnormalities. So just in relation to um, major depressive episodes, 
depression is not the same. Um, there are different kinds of depression. We tend to be perhaps overly focused in a, on a hospital basis with the biological depressions. That they are the unipolar depressive um, illnesses and the depressed phase of bipolar illness. Now, we refer to these as biological because there is a, an abnormal shift within the central nervous system genetically predetermined whereby for a period of time the central nervous system is not generating sufficient energy levels to meet the requirements on a day-to-day -day basis. So there is a go slow within the system. <coughs> Uh, treatment for biological depression, because it's a biological anomaly, has to be of an intervention type, as in the form of pharmacological intervention or sometimes in the form of electroplexy or ECT. <coughs> Far more common than the biological depressions are, of course, depression arising as a result of something happening in somebody's life or perhaps a series of things happening in usually in relation to losses, resulting in a whole plethora of emotional and psychological symptoms arising because of that. Sometimes the emotional upset or difficulty actually relates to something that's happened quite some time ago. And sometimes, in fact, it can go all the way back to childhood or early adulthood. So seeking out from psychiatric history taking and the evaluation of symptoms because there are subtle differences in symptomatology of depression between the biological depressions and the non-biological depressions, it's possible to, to, to define which kind of depression it is. The diagnosis, not just of depression, but the type of depression is absolutely crucial in order to succeed in following the appropriate treatment path to recovery. If there's, a, if there's a misdiagnosis, as it were, in terms of the nature of the depression, well then the treatment pathway may not be the appropriate one. In general, non-biological depressions require some form of psychological intervention. Medication may have a role to play, but it's usually not the primary role. So treatment then is biologically medication, mood stabilizer intervention, reactive non-biological psychological support therapy with maybe some judicious use of um, medication. Um, I don't want to go into the details of antidepressant medication here really because we're kind of more interested in recovery rather than the ins and outs of treatment. But suffice to say that most of the antidepressant treatments we have now um, are either focused on the serotonin system, the SSRIs, or they're focused on the noradrenaline system or a combination of the two. And some of the medications we have focus on the dopamine system. Now, there are more sy systems within the central nervous system than just those three, but we can come back to that a little bit later on with, with the innovation end of things. So how common is... Um, a moderate depressive episode, so that's mod of moderate severity. So Kessler was the first psychiatrist uh, who had a look at facts and figures back in the 90s in the USA, and his um, original estimation of lifetime prevalence, the risk of developing it at some stage in a person's life, was for men 12.7% and women 21.3%. Now, the, the decimal points in that are really not that significant. Uh, what is significant, I suppose, is that there's nearly twice as many women as men at risk of a significant depressive episode in the course of a lifetime. But from the work he did, um, he had a look at what the combination of moderate depression plus um, bipolar plus minor depression, they would be mild symptoms obviously but maybe frequently recurring mild symptoms and he came up with significantly different figures 20 percent you might say for men and 31 percent for women so that's a lot of people isn't it or in in terms of collectively um, in in the room in the world in 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 um, in our country so you're talking about one in every five men and one in every three women at some time will have a significant depressive episode um, not, not defining which kind of depression, just, just um, in, in a global way. 
And, you know, if someone, man or woman, has the, the, the misfortune to have a um, moderate depressive episode, there's a 50% chance that he or she will have a further episode um, during the course of, of, of their lives. And if someone, if someone is unlucky enough to have had two moderate depressive episodes, well, they're at risk, there's an 80% risk that they're going to have a third. So it's relatively common and it can be recurrent. So it's widespread in that sense. Now, there are a lot of factors that, that feed into the risk um, and the issue of, um, of, of depressive um, disorder. There can be a genetic vulnerability to it. Um, we mentioned the, the, the bipolar and unipolar um, depressions can tend to have a family history somewhere along the line. Now, it's also true to say that somebody's personality makeup and the excess of traits that they might have of one kind or another can also be a predisposing factor. You know, our personality, which is the sum total of all of our traits and uh, characteristics, 60% of our personality is inherited and 40% then is acquired, usually in the first four or five years of, of, um, of childhood. So, you know, the saying that someone is a chip off the old block, there's, um, there's actually some truth in it. So if someone is extremely anxious by nature, they're more prone to bouts of anxiety and perhaps low mood in the course of their lifetime. If someone ha has a very perfectionistic personality, they're less likely to be uh, easily adaptable um, uh, to some, something unexpected happening in their lives. So there again, they, their risk will be slightly increased. The um, other risk factors around the, the circle there, the risk of recurrence I've, I've already men mentioned. Um, obviously, treatment Diagnosis and treatment is one thing, but preventing um, a depressive disorder from arising in the first place is, is a separate issue. The, there is a risk because um, people may not realise the ins and outs and the extents of symptoms of not, not complaining and not presenting for diagnosis in the first place. And even in doing that, there is the risk that um, the treatment, even if appropriate, there may be a tendency to stop short rather than continuing it for a sufficiently long period of time in order to reach um, a, a period of remission. Sometimes under treatment is related to a compliance factor. You know, the, the, the patient in whatever situation, the person, the client going for for, for treatment with a psychotherapist, treatment is, is only going to, to work um, if the person perseveres and follows through with the advice. So we've talked about the widespread nature of it and factors, some of the factors associated with it. Um, what, what else might make it significant in, in, in the world we live in and, and in our own country indeed? And there's, there's quite a bit of, um, of emphasis on the economics of depression. Someone who's depressed and trying to struggle to keep going and going to work and, and trying to manage may not be and is unlikely to be working to their full potential. So their productivity is going to be, is likely to be compromised despite their best efforts. If a moderate depressive episode is more um, serious, obviously the person may not be able to get out of bed, may not be able to get to work at all and function. So you have the issue and the economics of absenteeism. Then if hospitalisation is required, that costs money on the public um, health system. And even in terms of the, the private system, obviously health insurance and all that costs money too. And then there's the additional um, costs um, incurred in attending um, a clinic situation or um, attending um, a GP. So there's, there's a significant um, money issue associated with significant depression. So what's the, what's the, the, the upside or the downside, or are there more downsides to, to what we're saying? Well, we're saying that depression is a treatable condition once identified. And once it's identified and diagnosed, 
well then the diagnosis needs to be uh, very clear and, and very definite and a, a treatment plan needs to be worked out. And it may or may not involve medication and it may or may not involve the input of other disciplines. So there's depression on the one side and then of course we're, we're trying to aim towards recovery and part of aiming towards recovery is to, is to foster hope and belief that the intervention will work. So having gone through the, the, the initial sort of ABC, as it were, of depression and diagnosis, we're interested in having a further look at the road to recovery. I'm not sure whether that looks like the yellow brick road. It does a bit, does it? It's kind of cute. <laughs> But what I was, well, I was wondering if there was one with the Tin Man and, uh, and uh, the, um, yeah, the red shoes and, and all of that. But anyway, it seemed, uh, it seemed like uh, you know, a road, the road to recovery. So it's about um, getting onto the road, isn't it, and following the path in order to reach uh, the destination, which is um, re- full recovery, hopefully, and restoration of well-being. So just as a general run through, there are some do's and don'ts of recovery. So as I've already mentioned, you know, if you, if you seek help, uh, well then, you know, it's really important to follow the guidelines and to follow the advice and to, to comply with medication if, if that's the outcome. And insofar as is reasonable without overstretching yourself if you are um, depressed, it's, it's good to have some level of activity of something to occupy you. Um, It helps pass the time because time can really drag if you're feeling depressed and you just don't feel like doing anything and you sit in the chair, you lie in the bed all day. So it's worth just having maybe the odd thing to do or trying to focus on a goal to do something rather than not doing anything because it it, it will help self-esteem anyway and it certainly helps pass the time. So it obviously stands to reason that taking care um, of yourself generally is, is helpful. And that includes having some proper food at, at regular meal times. Um, often it seems like too much trouble to cook something and it's easier just to have a sandwich and then that can become um, you know, kind of a daily thing that you don't bother with dinner, you have a sandwich instead, or you have a yogurt, you have something. And you know, even after a couple of days of that, um, you're, you're, you're not feeding your nervous system and you're not supplying um, your, your system generally with the appropriate balance of nutrients that, that, your, that your nervous system needs in order to, to take over as well as it can in the circumstances. Exercise may seem impossible if you're down and out and in a heap, but even going for a walk around the garden or a walk around the block, um, some exercise, preferably just with some fresh air rather than than staying indoors on an exercise bike, is is helpful too. It just helps to keep the system and even your 24-hour clock in some way in order. Having some time to yourself rather than always being in company is helpful, although having good company some of the time is always beneficial. So friends, obviously our friends because they understand us and they they look out for us. Family are part of the the, the basic unit we, we all belong to and support groups, including aware, but not only aware, clearly have a role to play and can be, there can be um, great support if someone is really struggling in order to keep going and to progress. In relation to do, this is do not really, it's avoid. Um, if someone is low and they're struggling and they're not feeling good about themselves because they're not able to do all the normal activities and they're feeling um, that they're um, of no value to anyone else and they're not feeling good about themselves. You know, coming in contact with, with someone, um, either family or, or outside family, who is um, going to be critical and going to be past remarkable is only going to make a difficult and a bad situation worse. So I would say, you know, it's, it's good if you can 
to avoid certain people in your life if you're under the weather and you feel they're just going to make you worse. So, so you try and stick with um, associating with people who are good for you. And in other words, people who kind of radiate um, a sort of a, a, an understanding and an energy rather than someone who's, who's potentially going to be critical and, and draining. So do um, set some goals. Well, as I say, even if it's just to cook something rather than resort to the sandwich or the, 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 the toast again is worthwhile. Um, encouraging yourself, as in trying to um, encourage or have um, something you repeat to yourself that somehow helps to, to keep you going and, and, and keep you focused on, on, on looking forward rather than, the, than uh, looking back over your shoulder and feeling badly. To have some belief or faith isn't really meant to be um, a religious reference, but just in terms of um, update and advances, we'll, we'll come back to that um, perhaps. Um, it, in a more general, generic way, it of course refers to having or trying to have, trying to hold on to some belief or some faith in yourself um, that you can um, hang on in there and get through and there, that there are better times ahead. And sometimes, you know, hearing that from other people too, of course, uh, reinforces what something might, other, what might otherwise be um, a bit shaky. So the don'ts in terms of being depressed, don't overindulge in food. There is sometimes a sweet tooth associated with, with feeling low and a, a kind of a, a, a temporary um, comfort in eating something sweet and, and eating chocolatey things in particular. Um, and then there's that sense of fullness afterwards and, and not really feeling any better. Um, too much caffeine, either in tea or coffee or Coca-Cola, um, tends to give rise to symptoms of nerviness or, anx or anxiety. It, it can be associated with gastritis and, and tremors. So um, there might be a temptation to keep drinking cups of tea or have a cup of coffee and you might feel a bit, a bit more energized afterwards, but it, it's, it's not the solution. So going easy on it is important. Alcohol, of course, overall is a depressant, so it might give temporary relief in the form of um, real, someone, helping someone feel a bit more relaxed or a bit more at ease, but the net effect is a depressing one. And the effect of alcohol is likely to be magnified in someone who's depressed already. It's as if their nervous system is even more um, prone to the adverse effect of the, the toxic effect of alcohol and other substances. That goes without saying we're talking about illicit um, substances. None of them can, can be of, of value in terms of recovery. Um, the other piece is, um, you know, sometimes there's a tendency to overcompensate um, if you're feeling low and maybe you might feel a little bit better at some point in the day or on a particular day and, and try and prove to yourself that um, you're, you're back in harness again and, and you can catch up on, on, on time that you've lost or on work that you couldn't get to do because you were so depressed in the, in the lead up to it. Pacing yourself is, is always important. Um, and even if you do feel a little bit better on a particular day, um, just do a bit more. Don't try and make up for lost time. Because recovery tends to be gradual, and it isn't necessarily a nice straight line of recovery. There can be ups and downs along the way. So not um, biting off more than you chew, more than you can chew, is um, good advice perhaps for all of us at any time. So we all belong to um, a family group or we, we belong to, to a social group and very often friends and families will ask, well, you know, if, what, what can I do? You know, I, I feel kind of helpless and um, I try and understand and I try and encourage, but, um, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm fobbed off and I, I don't get any, um, I don't really get any ideas as to, as to how to help. So family and friends, of course, are of infinite benefit just by just by being there just by hanging around and just by staying in touch um, apart from asking a general question about you know how are things 
Um, asking a whole load of questions tends to be a bit oppressive, so it's about measuring the amount of, of questions and limiting them. Um, helpful suggestions, even if they're not met with any enthusiasm, um, are sometimes still of value, so are worth coming, uh, coming up with. And a company. Um, it's both keeping company and if um, someone who's depressed has a doctor's appointment or they're going to a therapist, sometimes um, it's, it's really helpful to have the companionship of someone going along with you to the, the appointment rather than um, struggling and being there um, on your own. Um, the don'ts and for family of, and friends are um, don't, don't avoid someone who's depressed, even if you find them um, bad company and a drain and make you feel uncomfortable. Um, if you avoid, it'll be noticed and that might make a bad situation worse. Um, Cross-questioning, as in asking loads of questions. Bullying or nagging um, is clearly the opposite of being um, empathic and sympathetic. Um, so try and not do that. Uh, don't recommend a drink because um, that's not the, the way ahead either. That's not a, re um, a recovery um, op um, option. And of course, the no-no is um, the, um, the pull yourself together. Uh, which might at some time be on the tip of somebody's tongue to say, um, but it's, um, if someone could pull themselves together, they would have done so of their own volition. So the treatments to date um, are not perfect. Um, as some of you, I'm sure, have experienced yourselves, um, an antidepressant doesn't always work and sometimes even a combination of different or one antidepressant after another may not work either. Um, some um, psychotherapy may be unsuccessful and so there are limits to um, what's in our box of tricks as it were in relation to intervention and successful, um, successful outcome. So just in relation to the biological um, depression, so these are unipolar, someone who suffers from a unipolar depressive episode or a depressed episode of a bipolar illness. Um, there is a lot of genetic research going on into this area because we know there are many different genetic variants of both bipolar and unipolar um, depression. And there are several different um, treatment approaches, um, trying to identify genomes and trying to look at what um, therapy may directly counteract, as it were, the adverse effect of that particular genetic uh, uh, variant of a biological depression. Um, the, there's always been a kind of curiosity about the link between the pain pathways and low mood and the fact that if someone is depressed, um, their, their threshold for pain is increased. So there have been, uh, there have been attempts research-wise to identify this interactive effect. Now the, the work is still ongoing, but there has been recently published work looking at um, the success in someone who has this would be chronic pain situation and has coinciding depression because of that, looking at a combination of acupuncture for the pain and counselling to try and counteract the, um, the effect of um, pain on, on, on mood. And there has been, it has been shown in, 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 in controlled trials that that has some additional value, but obviously it's, it applies to a limited area, but nevertheless, a, 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 a significant uh, number of people do suffer from chronic pain and depression is, um, is part and parcel of, um, of that syndrome. The shift biologically um, over the last couple of years too, apart from the genetic end of things, is looking at other pathways, neurotransmitter pathways within the brain and identifying that some of those pathways seem to be distorted in, in some biological depressions. A lot of this work is only possible because of advances in 
um, radiomunassays and in scanning techniques and also in, in picking up micro levels of substances from, uh, from the bloodstream and cerebrospinal fluid um, around the, bla- the brain and that. So there's a lot of interest now in, in glutamate receptors. Glutamine is one of the transmitter systems within the brain. It hasn't come into the, the picture as far as depression, depression is concerned until really the last two or three or four years. There's a lot of excitement about it, but the jury is still out as to exactly its role to play. But it's really um, helpful to think that there's, there's, there's an additional pathway that may, that may be possible to explore and may somehow complete the, the pieces of the jigsaw that we need in order to, to really uh, visualize and understand and be able to, to correct um, abnormal biological changes within the central nervous system. system. There is also um, an interest both here and elsewhere um, in the issue of whether in some people with depression there can be um, antibodies identified to certain um, receptor sites uh, within the central nervous system. And there is a train of thought um, which is only only being explored research-wise, and so there aren't answers or there isn't any um, protocol yet. There's a train of thought that's considering that some forms of depression may actually represent a form of autoimmune disease of the central nervous system. Now, autoimmune diseases are much studied over a long period of time, um, mainly the arth- arthropodes, They're, they would be um, rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. But this is an additional piece that some people who are depressed have raised antibodies to certain um, uh, chemical uh, sites within the central nervous system. So the possibility that if there was a variant of significant depression with um, an antibody production problem, that therefore immunotherapy, that, that would be likely to be um, not so much steroids because that can trigger depression or mood change anyway, but other forms of cytotoxic agents which are used in other conditions may in fact be a successful adjuvant in, in biological depressions or may in fact be um, successful in their own right. This is just a completely different um, train of thought to anything that's gone before. Um, and it's, it's, it's really hopeful and exciting, but it's still, you know, the jury is still out and it's likely to be um, a few years yet, maybe five, maybe a bit more before there is something definitive, but it's encouraging. Um, the homocysteine, homocysteine is a, an amino acid and proteins are made up of amino acids in the same way as starches are made up of sugars. So in relation to um, proteins um, in, in our bodies, the, each protein is made up of some combination of 23 of the amino acids which are available and cysteine is just one. Now, in bipolar depression and unipolar depression, in some studies, there has been a demonstrated um, increase in homocysteine levels. There's also been, in, in, in these patients studied, uh, an, an overactivity of the glutamate receptor. And that combination of um, increased uh, homocysteine and increased activity of glutamate receptor is in a significant number of, of patients associated with reduced vitamin B12 levels and with um, reduced folate levels. Now, association doesn't mean causation, and there is still um, an uncertainty about what it means because it's not a universal finding. Um, but it is true to say that increasingly now, um, certainly in this hospital, we are checking B12 levels and folate levels 
even on patients coming in in, uh, in the under 65 age group, whereas it's been hospital policy up till now to check B12 and folate in the elderly because it can contribute to um, conditions um, associated with um, dementia and that anyway. And sometimes the elderly would have deficient diets, but we're, we're now doing it in, in, in younger age patients, particularly um, in the biological depressed group because you know it's easy to, to treat a vitamin B12 or folate um, deficiency, and so but you need to pick up on it in the first place in order to, to treat it. So it may not to date make any additional sense, but there are additional um, pathways opening up, or so it seems, apart from the genetic ones, which um, which are really encouraging. So there's the biological basis to things, and then there's, there's psychological, um, apart from social. So in relation to so psychological advances, um, I suppose it's not really true to say that compassion-focused therapy is, is a new advance, because it's been around for quite some time. Uh, CFT, as it's known, as short, not, not, it's unrelated to, as per se, to um, cognitive behaviour therapy, which is the CBT. You'd be all uh, more familiar with, uh, with hearing about. So Paul Gilbert was the um, psychologist who um, was interested in and developed um, his own form of psychotherapy to facilitate um, individuals who are who have an inner voice in their heads that is constantly um, critical, self-critical, and uh, self-disregarding. And, well, he talked about being the, the harsh and punitive voice in somebody's head. Now, this isn't um, an hallucinatory experience, so this has nothing got to do with hearing voices. This is um, the, the automatic comments that we make to ourselves regularly, every day of our lives about, uh, oh, you know, why did I do that? Or, oh, you know, I'm always doing that. Or, oh, you know, why, what, what might somebody think of me? So it's, it's that voice. And uh, for some people, it's continuously harsh and critical. And it's, it's, it's oppressive and it's depress potentially depressing. And it's, it's a way of having a look at how we can change the, um, the, the pattern of... Um, of, of self-chat, as it were, that, that, that goes on in order to be more helpful um, and less continuously negative. The um, next sort of bullet point there is religiosity, which is a term being used in, in research. Um, and we talked about the importance of hope or faith. Um, a study that's just referred to there um, is an American-based study uh, looking at um, a, a, a large elderly population of um, people, men and women, living in their communities. So it wasn't hospital-based or nursing home-based. Based. And um, they, they looked at um, a group over a two-year period, and they compared um, those who got depressed during that time with the ones who didn't. Um, and they looked at various factors that they had um, recorded in the, um, at the beginning of the study, and then they looked at again at the end of the study. And they discovered that the, um, the elderly pe um, people participating in the study who um, retained a religious belief of whatever kind and who practiced it were much less likely to become depressed over the course of that study compared with um, those who were not religious at all or who had some religious belief but didn't practice it in a collective way. So in other words, they, they didn't go to church or didn't go to um, the, 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 the local hall or, or, or um, centre where maybe religious practice was, was, uh, was carried out because obviously... Um, religion has often been referred to as, um, as perhaps um, uh, an opium of, of, of the masses, that it, it's, it's helpful in terms of coping 
although in other ways, you know, if it's in, in terms of scrupulosity and that, it can be unhelpful. But just in general, it gives a context to life and um, it's, it, it's regarded as, as over time, oh, down through the ages, as, as perhaps being a support rather than, um, than not being one. But in relation to the study and the conclusion um, was that um, it should be taken into account um, in looking after or, or trying to um, consider facilitating the elderly um, and in avoiding depressive episodes that in the event of uh, an elderly person being infirm and being unable to get to their local um, church or their, their local um, religious centre, um, that you know, more thought might be given to um, providing transport or, or, or encouraging um, the, um, the, the, the families involved to, to allow the elderly make the effort to, to go to church if, that's, if that has them in their practice and that's what they, they're, they're choosing to do, uh, rather than just ignoring it, saying, oh, well, you know, you're, you're of an age now and sure, you're not required to do that, or oh, sure, you know, don't bother doing it, as it were. The um, other bullet point there is mindfulness. Now, obviously, mindfulness in itself isn't an advance because it's old. It goes back um, uh, a long, long time ago, and uh, it, it has quite a history to it. But in relation to the world we live in, and in particular the country we live in, and over the last five years, it's probably never been so relevant. Um, it's, it refers to a form of um, relaxation technique, control of mind, or uh, in that sense, being able to relax the mind. But in addition, other, it differs from other forms of um, anti-tension or relaxation or meditation in that it also um, has attached to it, as it were, um, a philosophy um, and not ruminating, not going back on the past and not continually anticipating the future in some sort of fearful or questioning way. So the past is history, and the future is, 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 is mystery. Past is history, future is mystery. So, you know, the only thing we actually have control of and the only thing we can actually do something about is the now. So it's today, this evening, now. That's, we only have control over that. And so letting go of the past, if, if you're inclined to keep going over and over it and ruminating it, or anticipating the future, particularly in a fearful and negative way, and spending time, wasting time really, anticipating it, when more often than not, even in doing that, realisation um, is, is different and is usually easier than the actual anticipation of it. So the other advanced piece is the social end of things. So we're all, we're all obviously biopsychosocial, aren't we? We're biological, we have psychological uh, things going on in our heads and then we're aware of the world around us and then there, there's the, the social settings we find ourselves in. And it's been known for a long time, it's not new, that of course living in or having, um, having a hopeful um, environment or hopeful culture is significantly beneficial as far as um, general mental health and well-being of uh, public or society is, is concerned. Um, you know, in terms of, of leadership and, um, um, I suppose, the encouragement and uh, a guidance, as it were, in, in, in sort of seeing it through it, seeing us through it, it, it it's, it's, there's been a deficit, hasn't there? The, we, we haven't had the sort of the... the, the, sort of the uh, the, the leadership or the, uh, the, the reassurances. We've been constantly told how dire the situation was and how terrible it was, and unless we were paying even more taxes, you know, we'd, you know, yeah, we'd never survive. So that really has had quite a detrimental effect. And um, at this point, and with some green shoots, although we've been hearing about them for a while, um, we, we, we badly need to look to the future with some hope and some optimism. And um, I think maybe at a personal level, uh, we, we, there's something we can do about our own individual outlooks and hope that that spreads. And uh, collectively or at a community level um, or within uh, a parochial level, 
um, that that's going to spread because having a hopeful environment is certainly beneficial for all of our well-being. The next bullet point there, network, um, I suppose just in terms of internet and internet being so much part of our lives nowadays, there has been an attempt to look at and see if using um, the internet using certain sites on the internet might be beneficial in, in warding off a tendency towards um, depression in someone who's showing early signs of it. So web-based guided self-help was a, a study recently published uh, whereby um, employees of a particular company were identified and they were divided into two groups, vulnerable group, um, and one had access to web, a web-based guided self-help site um, and the others didn't. And looking at comparing the two at the end of a one-year period, um, there, was, there was no additional benefit to the web-based guided self-help. So you know, maybe we need more people help and direct contact um, in terms of warding off depression or recovering from it rather than interacting with the computer or the internet. But you know, it's early days. There's, there's, um, there's, not, there's, there's very limited um, guidance in that way as yet. So cultural values, um, you know, that's in relation to the hope bit, really, and the sort of society we have. And the idea that um, whether people care about themselves and whether they care about each other does make a difference in relation to um, depression in the first place and recovery um, in, in recovery uh, in the second place. And just to say that even in the worst of times, like in war situations, where communities are really suffering hardship and maybe, um, may, may, have, may have lost a lot, there tends to be a sense of, of cultural cohesion and an, an identification within, within the group. And there's, there's a cohesiveness about that situation, dire as it is. And just to remind you that in such dire situations, suicide rates are extremely low. So even though the situations are desperate and it may be a hopeless situation or look like a hopeless situation, where you have people collected together and working towards or fighting towards a common good, suicide rates go down. Now, as you know, in, in, in Ireland, suicide rates have been, have been going up. So we need to, in terms of recovery and well-being, we need to think about how we can look towards uh, the future um, with, some, with some more hope and, and optimism to help ourselves as individuals, but also to help um, ourselves as, as a group or as a nation. So be aware of depression is the message, um, because it's being aware is required and doing something about it in order to succeed in recovery. This, the, the story and the um, treatment options are improving all the time. The, and they're likely to improve still further from a worldwide perspective because the World Health Organization now counts depression within the, the top four uh, most disabling conditions in the world today. Now that's horrible, horrible in one way. In another way though, it does mean that the, the focus of, um, of the um, of research worldwide is going to be more and more on, on depression and looking at ways of both treatment, treating it more successfully and of um, improving the road to recovery and ultimately, of course, in preventing, hopefully, depression taking a grip or being so disabling um, into the future. So thank you.